My name is Jane Eliasoff, and I would like to thank you for joining us today or tonight at the History at Home. Um, and I'm really excited about today's program because, first of all, I saw it at noon, and I think you're going to love it. Um, second of all, we're sandwiched really in Montclair between Hinchcliffe Stadium and Rupert Stadium in Newark, so it kind of puts us in an ideal position. Um, and third of all, of course, we have Larry uh, Doby and uh, Monty Irvin was around. And so we really kind of have a connection to the uh, Negro League um, baseball. Um, those uh, of you who have supported us in the past, we really appreciate it. Um, we do these programs free and have been doing them since last April. And uh, if you do have a spot in your heart to give us a little something, we'd really appreciate it. There are four ways that you can do it. You can do it with uh, sending us a check the old fashioned way, 108 Orange Road, Montclair, New Jersey, 07042. Um, there is a link on our website, montclairhistory.org. That's also where you can go to find out about other upcoming programs we have. And you can do it via Venmo, search for Montclair History Center. My name will pop up, but that's okay, it's legit. And then the last one is Zelle. We now accept Zelle. So if you um, uh, would like to do that, we'd really appreciate it. The, the words and the sweet thoughts we've been getting have just been making my day. Let me tell you, it really has been. Even one came in today after the program um, tonight, say, or this afternoon, just saying how much she's enjoyed it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eve because Eve Shannon, this is a joint program of actually three nonprofits You've got the Montclair History Center, you've got the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center, and you have the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And I'm delighted. I always love partnerships, but I'm really delighted with this one, and I think you will be too. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eve, and Eve, you can take it from there. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, Jane. Um, yes, it's also my turn to say thank you. It's been terrific to partner with the Montclair History Center and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. As you can maybe see, I am sitting in the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center. Um, we are situated, for those of you who don't know, on the campus of Montclair State University. So what, what Jane was describing about the geography and the significance of the Negro Leagues in this part of the country, that's one of the reasons why I felt it was very important as a baseball museum that we help to tell and amplify some of the stories of these remarkable athletes who played in the Negro Leagues, especially because 2020, as you all may know, was the 100th anniversary of the founding of those leagues in Kansas City. So uh, the folks of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and especially Ray were kind enough to let us borrow a traveling exhibit that they have called Discover Greatness, an illustrated history of Negro Leagues Baseball. That's what you can see on the walls behind me. It is in our museum currently, that's the good news. The less good news is that our museum is closed right now because of COVID and has been for the last few months. But what we did is we just put the exhibit online. So if you visit us at yogibearamuseum.org, you can see these remarkable photographs. There are 90 of them. They feature a lot of the players and the teams that you'll hear about tonight from Ray. And um, the hope, fingers crossed, just about everything crossed, then in May we'll be able to open our doors again for in-person visits. And then I encourage you again to go to our website, yogibearamuseum.org, and you can schedule a visit, you know, pay in advance for a timed entry and come visit and, and see this exhibit yourselves. So um, again, so grateful to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum for letting us tell this story here. Um, it really is aligned with the values that we hold dear as a museum, starting and ending with respect and inclusion for, for all. So um, Ray, I'm gonna turn it over to you. My introduction is Raymond Doswell. He is the Vice President of Curatorial Services at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City and a great friend of our museum. And uh, Ray, the evening's yours. Well, good evening, baseball fans. We're so excited to be with you this evening. And uh, greetings from the heart of America, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I'm Raymond Doswell, and I'm coming to you live from the garden level of the museum, which is my basement office, frankly. <laughs> but uh, we're excited to be here with you. We're excited to teach you a little bit about Black history and baseball history. I'm going to share my screen with you all and um, tell you about Black history and baseball history while we also take a quick walk 
through our exhibits. I have some slides I'll narrate for you and show you some images and we'll talk about the context of how baseball fits within uh, the African American story, as well as show you our museum. So again, uh, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is located in Kansas City, Missouri. In a normal year, we average about 60 to 70,000 visitors. Uh, we are open. We have been open since June of last year uh, after the closures of, for the pandemic. Uh, and we're open with reduced hours uh, and our gift shop is open. You can order things online as well. And of course, we have memberships opportunities as well. And we'll talk about those at the end. Museum was founded in 1990 in a one-room office and then grew into a uh, temporary exhibit space in 94 and to our current exhibit space, which opened in 1997. This is the Field of Legends, which is part of our permanent exhibit now. This is the end of the exhibition. I'm showing you the end of the story first. The idea is that when you enter the museum, you walk around this field and then you can um, uh, learn all the history through photographs and artifacts, and then you end up on the field. Uh, and the field features life-size bronze statues of key players, African-American players, uh, and Latino players in Negro Leagues history. Many of them are inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. But the significance of that is that we are not a Hall of Fame. We're not the Black Baseball Hall of Fame. We're not the Negro Leagues Hall of Fame. We don't induct anyone. No one gets inducted to get a statue on the field. We were fortunate that many of these have been honorees were already there and they and it made up a great team lineup. So we're able to use them as models uh, for our field exhibit. But also, we don't want a segregated Hall of Fame because the Negro Leagues existed because of segregation and racism in America. So that's an important uh, philosophical stance for us. And uh, we wanna encourage uh, the Hall of Fame to continue to honor these players. But whenever possible, as space allows, we try to tell as many stories as we can from the bat boys to the home run hitters. So a very important part of what we do here. Now, normally when you walk into the museum and see this uh, exhibit, you see this first, actually. It's among the first things you see, but you can't get to it until you've gone around and learned all that history and you earn the right to walk onto the field. You normally peer at this, this mock all-star game through a chicken wire fence, right? And chicken wire was used in a, uh, or uh, other types of wire and fencing was used behind the back catcher and, and the umpire to make sure that you, you as a fan wouldn't get hit by any baseballs. But in some places, the chicken wire was used to segregate the seating. Black sat on one side of the seating while white sat on the other. I have to remember in one of my future presentations, there's a famous photo of the great Babe Ruth actually visiting a black section in a ballpark and the fans loved him and they wanted and he took a picture with all the fans in the in the so-called colored section of the of the stadium um so you endure this history as these players endure it because you're separated and segregated from it as well and then you get us hopefully a better appreciation for the experience now, I want to tell you a quick story first before we go on our tour. Uh, when you walk around the museum, um, just over the center field wall and on the other side of it, uh, we do that's the middle of the ex exhibition and we have a special display. It's dedicated to one player. Um, we have a photograph of this player on the wall. The original photograph is only about four by four Polaroid photo. We blew it up and made it larger and it's of a young athlete. There's not a baseball or a cap or a bat or any kind of baseball equipment anywhere in the photo. It's just a young man standing near the train station ready to leave, and he is an athlete being recruited to play baseball. Um, we're fortunate to also have a copy of a letter that accompanied this photo. The photo and the letter was an exchange between two baseball officials in the Negro Leagues recruiting this young man. And the writer of the letter notes uh, something very important. He says in a letter, I do think he will develop into a great player one of these days. I do think he will develop into a great player one of these days. Well, the author of the letter is quite prophetic because he does develop into a great player, one of the greatest of all time. He is being recruited by the Indianapolis Clowns in the early 1950s. He's a cross-handed infielder who once they change his batting stance, he begins to hit the cover off the ball. He joins the Clowns briefly 
uh, within a few weeks is discovered by the Braves organization and goes on from there to become the all-time home run leader in Major League Baseball and as the late great Henry Aaron, who we lost a few weeks ago. Um, but an outstanding player shows you the talent uh, that was in the Negro Leagues. Um, the top photo there um, in the corner there, the color photo, uh, this was at a press conference in 1999 where he came to visit the museum. And you see above our name there, there's a motto and it says, discover greatness, discover greatness. That is our motto. And that little Polaroid photo is a moment when greatness is discovered. Uh, and uh, we like to exemplify that through lots of stories, uh, interactive exhibits, film and other information about the history of the Negro Leagues. Now, of course, we don't use the term Negro anymore as a descriptor for African-Americans or to, I used the word colored earlier. We don't, those are archaic terms in many respects, but for the sake of authenticity, we use those names because that's what was used back then. That's what they called themselves. And then baseball teams and leagues are small businesses. So you see these names within those business titles as well. But if we think about it, what were the Negro Baseball Leagues? So here at the museum, we try to define it this way. It's a business structure uh, representing the highest level of professional baseball available to African-American and Latino athletes during the late 19th century in the 1800s through the mid 20th century in the, in the mid the 1900s, all right? Um, and it's always leagues plural because there was multiple leagues and certainly multiple teams and the teams of course being groups of baseball players uh professional or semi-professional or otherwise organized into leagues groups of teams who agree to play common opponents on a regular schedule uh for a number of games as a season and perhaps have a postseason and determine a champion maybe some revenue sharing and, and rules that would govern uh, transactions of players and, and, and discipline, as well as um, revenue sharing and other things, all right? Uh, these Negro Leagues existed because of racial segregation in America. And we study the role of these players between roughly 1860 and 1960. When we do that, uh, that's about 100 years worth of history. Uh, and it's, it's a broad history that takes us really from civil rights, I'm sorry, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. That's the way, one way of, of thinking that for you teachers out there, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. Baseball was happening, Black baseball was happening in many places in between that period. As you enter the museum, this is uh, when you come into the, the main doors and you see the atrium of the museum, this is our primary entrance. Um, it is made to look like an old baseball stadium. And you come inside and you actually go through some turnstiles and then you come upon this chart. This chart is meant to demonstrate some of the leagues and the teams and the scope of uh, the business of black baseball. And this chart actually only lists six different leagues. We actually recognize about eight different leagues here at the museum that are operating between 1920 and 1960, 1920 and 1960. But this chart goes from 1920 to 1955 and six of these leagues, which were organized roughly about 70 some odd teams not operating all at once, usually about 10 to 12 teams maybe within a league uh, or different leagues competing in interleague play, uh, but, are, but uh, originating mostly out of urban areas, roughly about 30 uh, of our major cities across the Midwest the Northeast and the Southeast. Um, this story for, for you social studies uh, enthusiasts out there, this story is rooted in the great migration story of African-Americans, the great migration story. So that is when African-Americans are moving after slavery, moving all over the country from rural areas to urban areas, and then even out of the South and all for plantation areas and sharecropping areas all together, moving out of the South to the Midwest and to the Northeast and looking for jobs, looking for freedom, looking for opportunity. And although they still are met with racism in many respects, they are able to create these cultural enclaves, especially in our urban centers. Um, so, and that includes St. Louis and Kansas City and New York and, and Newark and, and Detroit. 
uh, again, following railroad jobs in Kansas City, following the auto industry in Detroit, uh, following railroads and meatpacking in Chicago, uh, and creating neighborhoods like Bill Street in Memphis, 18th and Vine in New York, I mean, 18th and Vine in Kansas City. Uh, Harlem's already established in New York, but many uh, uh, established themselves there with other ethnic groups, and all are interested in baseball. Um, they're, but they're building their own churches, their own schools, their own bakeries, their own banks, and all these other businesses, and among them are baseball teams. And roughly by 1915, uh, before the cusp of the world of World War I, there are over half a million African Americans who've already moved across the country into these spaces, right? So let's look back 100 years. Um, in American history, uh, among the things that were happening 100 years from from now, uh, 100 years ago from our date, uh, were things like the so-called Spanish flu pandemic, uh, which lasted roughly 1918 and 1920, which of course greatly affected everyone's life across the country and around the world, including sports, as you see uh, these baseball players uh, in this one photo wearing masks to compete, uh, which may seem silly when you look at it on its face, but of course we are experiencing that right now with our athletics. Um, another thing that was happening were these virulent race riots that exploded across the country, uh, especially following World War I. Uh, the so-called Red Summer of 1917, uh, and, and particularly 1919 especially, um, in part due to the war, or the end of the war, I should say. African Americans and white soldiers are coming back from the war effort. Black soldiers have fought valiantly under segregated units in, in Europe and in France. Um, and everyone has to be acculturated. Folks need jobs. Folks need to come back into society. Uh, there are many folk uh, who were isolationists from the war and were afraid of what the influence of the war and, and the demands for freedom that African-Americans were asking for meant for a uh, white culture and a white race. Uh, many were afraid that the blacks were uh, inspired by the Bolsheviks and, and uh, the, communist, the, the new communist revolution that was happening in Russia during this time. Uh, and they were met with virulent racism. Um, racial groups were pitted against each other and there were riots all over the country in this time period. Uh, most notably in places like Houston, St. Louis, Arkansas in particular, uh, and probably among the more uh, violent ones was in Chicago. Days of rioting and uh, lynching as well as blacks fighting back against their oppressors. It was just a very, very difficult time. But African-Americans respond after this. Uh, they respond with an explosion of racial pride that included in, in, a, in a push for self-reliance. So that included the Harlem Renaissance and the new Negro movement as historians have described them. Um, they include explosion in literature and art, uh, people like Langston Hughes and, and art from Jacob Lawrence and many others, <coughs> excuse me. That included, coincided with the beginnings and rise of jazz music um, and early jazz music in particular, Benny Moten, uh, and then others will come along like Count Basie and Duke Ellington. It included uh, self-reliance movements, most notably uh, groups, even the early beginnings of the Nation of Islam. And um, uh, before that, the Marcus Garvey movement, the Back to Africa movement. Uh, that large picture there is of a parade in New York City for the Marcus Garvey movement, or the UNIA, I should say. Um, and you see the sign uh, in the parade car there, the new Negro has no fear. The new Negro has no fear. Folks want their rights uh, and they're pushing for this. And then uh, there's the debates between, uh, well, the rise of the NAACP is happening right after this and, and still the debate between uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington in terms of what were the best ways of approaching uh, ending segregation. And it's in this cultural mix and all these things that are happening uh, that the Negro Leagues emerge. Um, it's important to note, and this is our 1920 section in the museum, but it's important to note that before this, in the late 1800s, especially in the 1880s, there were attempts to create all black leagues. There were all black teams operating uh, to create uh, different leagues, but they, they lacked um, 
uh, a certain structure that will allow them to sustain themselves. Uh, and, and having league structure where you have regular schedules and sustainability uh, would mean uh, sustainability for, for the entire league. But even before that, um, this was a, those leagues and attempts of those teams had to form because they were not allowed to play in the white major leagues or what they would call the major leagues. And there were a handful of African-Americans who did play on white teams that would be designated major league. Um, there were a handful of players who pretended to be white, even though they had different ethnicity. Uh, so you can argue whether they count or not. <laughs> but uh, after that, there were others like Moses Walker. Um, Moses Fleetwood Walker and his brother Weldy, who played for teams in Toledo, Ohio, uh, and another player who was a professional player named Bud Fowler, who's from Cooperstown, who was born in and around Cooperstown, um, was another player who played on white teams at that time, considered among historians to be the first professional black baseball player. But Walker played in Toledo, which was a major league team, and there were some others. Uh, I'm noticing Eve at the Yogi Berra Museum standing next to the Page Fence Giants photograph, uh, of which I believe um, um, Walker Fowler, I believe it was maybe even both of them, um, were players or managers for that team, which was, that team was sponsored by the Adrian, the, the Page Rolling Wire Fence Company in Adrian, Michigan. All right, so you had, you had teams like that, mostly independent teams, but a team like um, the Page Fence Giants um, had sponsorship. They were the exception to the rule. Most teams would, you know, try to uh, uh, get started and they would stop and they couldn't sustain that 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 stability without a league structure. If you look at my slide there in the middle, uh, there's a statue, and the statue is of a man named Andrew Foster, all right, better known as Rube. Foster. Born in 1879 in Calvert, Texas, he was an outstanding pitcher in his own right, played in Latin America as well as a young player, uh, played in Philadelphia, played in Chicago. And ultimately in 1911, he formed a team called Chicago American Giants, which was a very prominent and good team. Uh, Foster was able to also uh, create business connections through white baseball for use of stadiums and and scheduling and things like that. So he was a, a very important entrepreneur in baseball history. Um, it was primarily under his guidance and with the help of many others uh, that a structure was formed to create a successful league. Um, he became the league's first president and they created a governing body for that league uh, in February of 1920. In fact, it's February 13th of 1920. Uh, this news article is from the Chicago Defender reporting on the meeting to organize uh, that league, which was called the Negro National League. Um, and the meeting was held here in Kansas City, right around the corner from the museum in the YMCA building on the Paseo Boulevard, known as the Colored YMCA then. That building still stands. It was built in 1914. Um, through money raised by the black community and it became a very important meeting place for African Americans and it was became if they were going to have a meeting of baseball officials in the Midwest, which mostly those teams were early on Kansas City and this building became a natural place for them to meet so uh, it's important to note too that the building stands we own the building and we're trying to renovate it to turn it into an education and research Center. That again, February 13th, 1920, last year was the 100th anniversary of that meeting. We're now in the 101st anniversary of that historic occasion. Uh, and um, we marked that occasion last year as best we could through the pandemic with programs and other initiatives in partnership with Major League Baseball and the like. And some of the early teams that were part of those leagues included most notably the Kansas City Monarchs, uh, which were owned by J.L. Wilkinson, who was a former baseball player and a baseball manager in his own right, organizing a team of mostly Army veterans and other players that he knew from his integrated uh, exhibition teams, uh, including one John Donaldson, who's there uh, uh, in the top row. Um, and they became a very successful team. Uh, the Chicago American Giants, who we mentioned earlier with Foster, were part of the league, the St. Louis Stars, 
were part of the league. Uh, there was a team in Dayton, there were teams in Indianapolis, mostly about eight teams in that first uh, incarnation of the Negro National League. A few months later, there was a, a group of teams that formed in the South. Uh, and then in 1923, there was the Eastern Colored League that formed, uh, mostly with teams in and around Philadelphia and the East Coast area um, that also formed. And then they became, the, they came to have interleague play. Uh, lots of rivals were built up through those league plays and um, some bitterness, but they ultimately figured out some ways to work together, including having their own Colored World Series in 1924. Now, mastering travel was a very important part of having a successful team. Um, one of the, the, the issues that Rube Foster identified uh, was teams were traveling around playing exhibition games or were in at the mercy of the train schedules. Uh, basically, you played where the train stopped if you could get games that way. So that made it difficult sometimes to maintain professionalism or, or, to, or to keep up a regular schedule or organize a league. But as roads improved across the country and ultimately we get building up to a road system and highway system, the teams that could master travel were the ones who were the long lasting and dominant because they could earn extra money uh, playing a lot of games, all right? Uh, so uh, for example, you might have a team in uh, Philadelphia, uh, the league team, and they would go and maybe want to travel to play against Harrisburg or then on to uh, New York City or wherever they wanted to go. Um, they could play their league games in Philadelphia, play their league games in Harrisburg, play their league games in New York City, but it, any towns in between their travels, they could play extra games. And that included white competition, included black competition, but not necessarily league competition. Uh, so if you had a bus and it was working or cars, you could get extra money, play extra games uh, and get a lot of practice in as well. So that was something that you had to navigate. And of course, navigating travel was very important in these times because it wasn't safe to always travel while black. It was segregated conditions on the trains, uh, segregated conditions in public accommodations, segregated conditions in hotels. So many teams like say the Kansas City Monarchs ultimately were able to build up a rhythm uh, with many different communities as they traveled across states and other places in getting games and making, earning, and making and earning extra money. Um, perhaps they, uh, before, first of all, you had to be good uh, and successful. And if you're good and successful and got a good reputation then you'd be invited to towns to wanna play. And the Monarchs in particular uh, could build up this network of places where they could play, including white communities. Maybe they invited them annually back for the 4th of July games. And these communities made money when the Monarchs and the, and the other teams came to town. So the Monarchs made sure that they had a place to stay and a place to eat, or, or they had a network of boarding houses or, or hotels and other places where they could stay. So it's easy when you're in Philadelphia. And it's easy when you're in New York because there are neighborhoods that will support you. But in between, you don't know what you're going to get into. Um, Missouri, in particular, was notorious back then for the so-called sundown towns, sundown towns. Uh, these towns had ordinances on the books that if you were Black and you were out after 6, 7, or 8 o'clock in the evening without working or you're not a delivery man or a chauffeur or something, you could be subject to arrest or questioning. Uh, so you never knew what was going to happen. So you either or driving all night, you made sure you had accommodations or you found some place to park that bus and sleep uh, if you wanted to get and survive the night or get to the, the game the next day. So travel and mastering travel in those conditions was very important for black baseball teams and for black people in general. You may have heard of the Negro Motorist Green Book, uh, which by the 1930s became a resource for many black travelers um, as it was kind of the uh, yellow pages of, of safe travel in places across the country uh, where people could, that people could use. And baseball teams certainly use the Green Book as well. Among the other innovations that Black baseball teams had were night, was night baseball. You see the photo at the bottom of my slide there has a uh, truck and a lighting pole system 
which was developed by Wilkinson and the Kansas City Monarchs. Now, there are a number of people experimenting with night baseball uh, in this period. This is around 1929, 1930. Uh, a number of people experimenting with it in more stationary night baseball. But the Monarchs developed this traveling system. So when they traveled on the road, they could take the lights with them. They usually, usually had two, maybe three trucks. They were connected by wires across each truck. And then the lights would, would be telescoped up and uh, you'd play and you'd hope that as an outfielder that the ball didn't go too far above the lights because you wouldn't see it until it came back down uh, at night. But uh, they mastered it and uh, this helped them survive because in 1929, 1930, you recall that there was a stock market crash and a Great Depression that soon happened after that. And uh, that affected uh, everyone, including the Negro Leagues. I mentioned the Negro National League and the Eastern Colored League. Both leagues folded their operations as businesses, but teams like the Monarchs continued to, to uh, uh, play on, and they had this lighting system. And also people could looking who were looking for work and food during the day could enjoy the baseball games at night as they traveled across the country. Now this slide in the museum is of the golden years because this is a point when the Negro Leagues began to rebound. After the depression of 1933, we saw the leagues rebound. Uh, among the folk who was responsible for that was a man named Gus Greenlee. Greenlee was uh, uh, from South Carolina, World War I veteran who uh, had businesses in Pittsburgh, uh, including a restaurant and a bathhouse. Uh, to put it politely, Greenlee is a benevolent gangster because he's the numbers runner in Pittsburgh, all right? Um, but he was a very shrewd entrepreneur. Um, he became, uh, he helped to reform some of the leagues and under uh, um, his and others leadership, they came up with some innovations. One of them was to develop an all-star game for the Negro Leagues. Now, this wasn't necessarily a new idea. Major League Baseball had started its own national all-star game also in 1933. But instead of moving the game around from place to place as Major League Baseball did, the Negro Leagues decided to have their game annually, for the most part, with a few exceptions. They had it annually in Chicago uh, at Comiskey Park. Uh, one, because uh, this was... Um, uh, established by Rue Foster, who unfortunately had passed away in 1930, uh, a business relationship with the Negro Leagues, with the White Sox, who owned the stadium, to use the stadium. It was a huge ballpark as well, uh, so it could accommodate a lot of fans. And finally, it's on the south side of Chicago, near the heart of the Black community. So there's restaurants, there's, there's businesses all around them that will serve the Black community and hotels, will serve the fans safely because many tourists would ride the trains to come and watch this showcase game. It really was something that everyone looked forward to. There was fan voting through the, through the newspapers. Um, and uh, it was an outstanding event uh, that was even bigger, say, than some postseason play uh, as far as interest was concerned. Um, we have a mock barbershop in our museum, which is among the businesses that uh, these communities had uh, and could serve the community. Uh, here, these guys are talking about the all-star game and chewing the fat and, <laughs> and just doing what guys do, I guess, and as they uh, talk about baseball in the barbershop. And this is just an example of some of the other things that were part of the community. Here's some turnstiles from Old Municipal Stadium in Kansas City, uh, where the um, uh, the Kansas City Monarchs played. They rented that stadium, um, <clears throat> which was also at one point also called Rupert Stadium, uh, Colonel Rupert, who owned the Yankees, because the, the Kansas City Blues, who owned that stadium, who played at that stadium, were the farm team for the New York Yankees as well. So the Monarchs rented that stadium, uh, and this kind of just shows you Matt Law's clothing store and the photo there, which is right across the street in the Lincoln Building, uh, where folks uh, would go. So you shop at the clothing store. You go down the street by trolley to Arthur Bryant's barbecue, and then you go south on Brooklyn to the stadium. Uh, and that made for quite an afternoon of baseball, food, uh, music, and fun because there were jazz clubs up and down here and 12th Street here in Kansas City. Other teams included the New York Black Yankees and the New York Cubans who played in that region. Uh, and for the most part, the Black Yankees who all occasionally played in Yankee Stadium, but most of the time played in Dykeman Oval or Hinchcliffe Stadium in Patterson. Um, we were fortunate to have this, this uh, 
unique magazine, Color Baseball and Sports, which I think was uh, actually published by among the uh, the owners of the Black Yankees, as well as some newspaper people there, because we don't have any photos of Hinchcliffe at the time that they had players and, and, and fans in the stadium. Most teams rented their stadiums. Hinchcliffe, as I understand, had always been kind of a community field that was used for a number of different things. So they had the opportunity to rent and use that in Patterson. Um, uh, and there are a few exceptions like the, the Crawfords and Gus Greenlee who uh, actually owned who built a ball field, uh, but those, they were the exceptions. So teams would play at places like Hinchcliffe and Patterson. Uh, and this is just an advertisement that's part of this magazine talking about the stadium and some of the games and teams that are scheduled there. And then in the region, of course, there was the Newark Eagles who played uh, at the ballpark that the Newark Bears played in, which was also another team owned by the New York Yankees. Uh, and they were uh, owned by Abe and Effa Manley, who you see in the photograph there. The Eagles were really a very popular team in the Negro Leagues and uh, I believe won the Negro Leagues championship uh, in 1946. I should know that more readily, but I'm sure someone will test me out and look that up for me. And of course, many fans enjoyed these games, black and white. This photo is from the 1950s, integrated crowds in Kansas City, very popular across the country. Um, something that a lot of people in the community could be proud of and enjoyed as a safe leisure activity against the backdrop of segregation and oppression. Now we're skipping ahead to World War II. Um, black soldiers are fighting valiantly again for their country against the Nazis and against fascists in Europe, but uh, suffering many indignities at home, including segregation and work uh, and in accommodations. And among those things that they can't do is to play baseball at the even higher levels of Major League Baseball. This is Ernest Spoon Carter, the player on the cover of this magazine. Uh, and uh, many in the black press and in sports uh, the irony of the role of the black player and the black soldiers not lost on many. Um, in particular, uh, the, the communist press in particular and the black press, the daily worker is pushing the issue of integration as a labor issue. Um, there are progressive politicians, especially in New York City, who are pushing this as a labor issue. Mayor LaGuardia sets up a commission to investigate integration in baseball. Um, the Yankees, uh, the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers all want to play baseball on Sundays. They need the city's permission to play baseball on Sundays. So there's leverage that the, uh, the politicians have over these baseball teams as an example. Um, and then there's the war itself, uh, where there's a draft of major league ball players and Negro league ball players, uh, and it depletes both leagues but less so in the Negro Leagues than it does in the Major Leagues. So there's still a fairly high level of talent and play in the All Black Leagues. Washington is a perfect example to discuss this because uh, the Grays decide to move from outside of Pittsburgh uh, in Homestead. Um, they move their operations from Homestead to Washington, D.C. to play at Old Griffith Stadium. Uh, Griffith Stadium is another big ballpark near the heart of the black community. It's actually the, the site of Griffith Stadium is, is now Howard University Hospital, which Howard University is a historically black college. Um, they rented the stadium from the Washington Senators, uh, which was the white major league team. And the Grays, you could, as a white fan, you could go watch the Grays, usually on the weekends, probably Sunday, and watch the Grays who are in a stretch of about nine straight Negro League postseason uh, appearances, a powerhouse team uh, in the late 30s, early 40s. You can go back on Tuesday and watch the Washington Senators, who might have been one of the worst teams in baseball. Um, the slogan was Washington, first in war, first in peace, last in the American League East. <laughs> and so you're a fan, uh, you're watching both games. You can see them both and you say, I was, you go on Tuesday, I, I was here on Sunday, these guys could really tear the cover off the ball and they could catch and they could feel, but why can't we have these players play? So the fans, the media, the politicians, all these things are kind of coming together in this, in this mix. And of course the war effort and everything is coming together. Blacks are fighting for their rights. There's a double V campaign in the media uh, for African-American newspapers, victory abroad, victory at home in an effort to end segregation in America. 
it's in this environment that we meet a young man named Jack Robinson. Uh, Jack Roosevelt Robinson, born 1919 in Cairo, Georgia. His family escaped sharecropping to go all the way across the country by train to Pasadena, California, where he grows up on Pepper Street in an integrated neighborhood where he gets in a lot of scrapes and a little bit of trouble amongst with his friends. But he admires uh, his siblings, including his brother, Mac, who is an outstanding national athlete, uh, and a collegiate athlete, and later becomes an Olympian in 1936 with uh, Jesse Owens for the United States Olympic team. But young Jackie is also very athletic and comes along and breaks all his brother's high school and AAU track and field records, especially in the broad jump, which is his best event. Um, uh, soon he plays other sports. There he is at the bottom photo in the middle there at Pasadena Junior College, where he played baseball and later transferred to the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, where he would also play baseball. Uh, compete in track and field, play basketball, and play football. The top photo there is number 28, your halfback, defensive back, uh, punt returner uh, extraordinaire was Jack Robinson. Um, I should point out he's pictured there with Willie Strode and Kenny Washington, who will become among the first African-Americans to play in the National Football League. So he could play tennis. He was good looking. What can you say? Uh, he had it all, uh, but he didn't quite finish at UCLA, uh, wanted to get some get to work. He met a young lady named Rachel Isom and hoped to marry her, uh, and, but um, was called to his duty by the United States Army. Uh, he would be stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, the 1st Infantry, the Big Red One, uh, here near uh, the museum. Um, and people know who he is. He's a minor celebrity. I mean, he played in the Rose Bowl, you know, before and people across the country, especially in black newspapers, knew who he was. Um, so it was a big deal that he went to the army. Uh, he wants to be a lieutenant uh, and wants to go to officer's training school, but he was rebuffed and he and other fellow soldiers were rebuffed by their white superiors. But another a young uh, soldier comes along and visits a base who has a little more gravitas and that is boxer Joe Lewis. Uh, who helps uh, shake things up so that Robinson and his fellow officers could go to training school. And they do, and again, he graduates as a lieutenant and he's transferred to Fort Hood, Texas, where he leads a tank battalion uh, to go over to, a black tank battalion to go over to the European theater. He cannot go because he has a number of sports injuries, mostly ankle injuries uh, that would prevent him from going into combat, but he was still fit for leadership duty. Now, uh, Robinson is discharged from the army, actually after a pretty ugly incident uh, where he was brought up on court martial charges for not moving to the back of a bus uh, while going to the base. Um, uh, he beats those charges, uh, and, um, but is discharged from the army and needs a job. And of course, baseball teams are looking for players because they've lost some during the war. And this is an opportunity for Robinson to go to fill in the blanks at, Kansas, at the Kansas City Monarchs who lost a number of players. There he is on, uh, on the right and on the left is the legendary Leroy Satchel Page, his teammate briefly in 1945 with the Monarchs. Uh, he's an infielder, he plays a decent infield. Um, uh, they said he didn't have a very strong arm but he plays second base uh, and um, is uh, really highly thought of. Again, people knew who he was but didn't think much of him necessarily in playing baseball because there are more famous players like Page who were around. But with all that other political and cultural things that were happening in the mix, this is a point when the Brooklyn Dodgers decide through many different gymnastics that they were going to try to have a black player. And they settle on Robinson, uh, who um, is 26 years old. And uh, under the leadership of Branch Rickey, the general manager, they signed him to a minor league contract uh, and, and, Mont for, and he plays a season in Montreal and then goes up to the Brooklyn Dodgers in April of 1947, becoming the first black in many years since the 1800s to break baseball's color barrier. Soon after that, we get this young man. Maybe you all recognize him. That's uh, Lawrence Eugene Doby on the right, uh, who uh, plays for the Newark Eagles 
uh, and under the Manleys. Uh, and soon after Robinson signs and comes up to the Brooklyn Dodgers, Doby is uh, picked by the Cleveland Indians and that's Bill Veck, the owner of the Indians on the left, uh, welcoming Doby to the team. Uh, so Doby didn't go to the minor leagues. He went straight from Newark to the major leagues in early July, I believe that was July 3rd, 1947. And soon after it opened the doors for other players. This is Hank Thompson, along with Willard Brown, who just a few weeks after Doby, I believe it was July 17th, 1947. And then there was another player after Brown as well to join the Dodgers. Um, but Thompson and Brown are recruited by the St. Louis Browns. But they don't last very long there. Willard Brown actually goes back to the Negro Leagues and tears up the ball and he's a home run hitter. Uh, and Hank Thompson ultimately gets traded to the New York Giants where he joins um, another great Negro League player from the Newark Eagles, um, Monty Irvin. And then another young man uh, with a lot of potential comes up and joins the Giants too. And that's a young Willie Mays and they go on to win a World Series under Leo DeRocha. Uh, it opens the door for great Latin players like Orestes Minoso, uh, better known as Mini Minoso. Uh, who played on many teams in Cuba as well as the Negro Leagues. Here he's with the New York Cubans. Um, um, and he gets recruited ultimately by the Cleveland Indians before being traded to the Chicago White Sox and becomes an iconic figure in White Sox history, one of the more outstanding uh, outfielders in baseball history. It also opens the door for coaches and uh, managers. This is John Jordan O'Neill, better known as Buck, Buck O'Neill. I was born in 1911 in Carabell, Florida, uh, and would come up through the ranks of the Negro Leagues, becoming a coach and manager with the Kansas City Monarchs, especially in the late 1940s, would become a scout and coach with the Chicago Cubs uh, in the 50s, and would be named the first Black coach in Major League Baseball in 1962 with the Cubs, where he mentored young players like Ernie Banks, uh, Lou Brock, uh, Billy Williams, among others. We have a new exhibit in the museum called Barrier Breakers, and it focuses on those players who help to integrate, players and coaches who help to integrate baseball. You notice the banner on our exhibit it says Barrier Breakers from Jackie to Pumpsy, 1947 to 1959. So Jackie Robinson being the first of that period, uh, and the last person was Elisha Pumpsy Green, who became the last player to integrate a major league team in 1959 with the Boston Red Sox. It takes that long before every one of the 16, 18 major league teams to get at least one black or Afro Latino player on their rosters. And in that period, we have about 120 or so plus players integrating and includes some of the great players of all time. Of course, we know about Dobie and Irvin. Um, uh, it also included Sam Jethro. Um, and Don Newcomb and Roy Campanella. Again, some of the greatest players. And then maybe some players that maybe you never heard of like John Kennedy who played with the Philadelphia Phillies. Again, the first player for the Phillies, black player for the Phillies, um, but who didn't necessarily play very long in the major leagues, but was we note him because he was the first. Bob Trice who played with the Kansas City Athletics. And there are other players like that who are important to the barrier breakers period. So black players uh, going to the major leagues meant black fans were going to the Negro Leagues uh, and uh, the attendance began to dwindle at these games. And there were some teams who tried a few things to try to keep fans coming out, including having women play with the men in the Negro Leagues. Uh, there are some pioneering women in this roles in the early 50s that included Tony Stone, Connie Morgan and Mamie Peanut Johnson, who we have in this new exhibit as well, focus on uh, women and women ownership in the Negro Leagues as well. But having the female players was not enough to keep Black fans coming out to games. And um, uh, the integration of baseball uh, was a slow process that began to, uh, to, to bring about an end to the Negro Leagues. Yet even though that process of integration was important, it was slow, and it was important for creating a just society, these teams in the Negro Leagues and their, uh, and their league structures began to fade away by 1960. But if we look at the 
uh, impact of these players, we see some remarkable results and statistics and how these players were able to compete and how their teams competed in Major League Baseball. Here are just two quick stats to exemplify that. The first year player award, the outstanding first year player award or rookie of the year award now named for Jackie Robinson was first given in 1947 to Jackie Robinson. Uh, and if you look at the results of subsequent winners, Almost all of them are Black or Latino players in that period. There's only a couple of years where it wasn't a Black or Latino player. And Robinson, Don Newcomb, Sam Jethro, Willie Mays, Joe Black are all players who played in the Negro Leagues. I like to mention Orlando Cepeda. His father played with Negro Leaguers, and he was very uh, familiar with the history of the Negro Leagues as well. The other award, the Most Valuable Player Award, which currently is the Kennesaw Mountain Landis Memorial Award after the former commissioner of baseball, uh, who was not necessarily a good advocate for integration. He said publicly he didn't care, but he didn't help either. And there's, there's um, uh, a movement to get his name off of this award. But still, uh, the MVP award, uh, again, dominated by Black and Latino players. You see Roy Campanello three times. You see Ernie Banks twice, Henry Aaron, uh, Don Newcomb, and Jackie Robinson. Again, Blacks are dominating these postseason awards. Again, uh, some of the greatest players, I'd argue this is the greatest influx of athletic talent to any sport period in the history of whatever. It's just, they were just that good. And uh, uh, segregation seemed ludicrous when you think about the impact of these players. Many of these players are inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And we have a section in our museum as we get close to the end that honors those players and officials who have been inducted by the Hall of Fame. Uh, they include uh, photograph placards uh, of the bronze placards that hang at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown and with mock uniform, replica uniforms of those players and officials. It also includes Effa Manley, who was owner of the Newark Eagles because she's the only woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And among those other players uh, who are honored, they do include, there's a young Henry Aaron in the top left, and the third photo is of young Ernie Banks with Kansas City Monarchs. But we don't have lockers for either of those. Um, they are inducted into the Hall of Fame for their play in the major leagues. But uh, William Judy Johnson and Norman Turkey Stearns and Ray Brown and Willard Brown have all been honored for their play in the Negro Leagues in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Finally, we get to the field area where you see these colorful replica uniforms of the teams now. In one of my previous photos, I, you saw some Monarchs uniforms. Those were real uniforms from the 40s um, attributed to New Dallin. Uh, but these are replicas um, with caps and things to show you just the colors that the teams would wear. Uh, we also have a close-up look of among our statues. This is Martin de Higo from Cuba. Outstanding pitcher in the Negro Leagues who can also hit high 300, low 400 batting average. So we needed a batter for our field. Why not get a 400 hitter? And so we have Martin DeHigo and he's a, he was outstanding player. And we also have added recently an umpire. This is Bob Motley, uh, who umpired late in the Negro Leagues in the 50s and lived here in Kansas City and the community wanted to honor him before he passed away and they raised the money to build this statue. We didn't have this originally in our uh, exhibit. So it fits very nicely and we're proud to have it there. And now you've earned the right to walk back onto the field uh, among the greats of the game. So it's time to take questions from you. I've talked enough and this uh, bat is carved by artist Rob Hatem for one of our art exhibitions. Uh, he, was, he wanted to ask the question, what would the Negro League, what would the record books look like if Negro League teams were included sooner? And moreover, what would uh, our society look like if African-Americans were treated more fairly? Of course, we can never know 100%, but we can always bring new questions to these topics and uh, we're glad to answer any questions that you have. Two quick slides before we do that, though. Uh, if you want to dig deeper into these resources and, 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 and into this information, here are some sites for you. You may have heard about the Negro Leagues being elevated to major league status, and that might include uh, implications for their statistics. Most of that data on statistics is being held at this website, seamheads.com. And there are many historians who have been working on that issue for years and years and years. So if you're interested in that, you can go to seamheads.com. And that's a, the whole elevation is a very complicated uh, 
thing, which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, but BaseballReference.com uses some of that data as well as cross-referencing that with a player who may have also played minor league baseball and major league baseball. So you get a fuller picture of a player's career. If you're interested in those players and officials inducted to the National Baseball Hall of Fame, this link will take you there to their wonderful page. And Retrosheet.org is a baseball stats uh, or information site that has uh, box scores and information from mostly every Major League Baseball game played going back to uh, the 1800s up to today, um, or at least the last season. Uh, and there's great information. They're, they're planning to add some more Negro League material there as well. I like to do a lot of my Jackie Robinson research there. And finally, if you want to learn more about the museum, there's our website, nlbm.com, where you can become a member and sign up for membership. Uh, we appreciate all donations, or you can shop in our museum store. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where uh, some of our online events and other videos are available for you to peruse. We have an e-museum for teachers. Uh, teachers, this site is going to be completely revamped and updated soon, but there's still some good stuff there, even some lesson plans you can adapt, and clips of oral histories of former players. Uh, we are on Facebook, where we do most of our live events virtually, uh, and uh, on Twitter, our museum account, as well as our president, Bob Kendrick, uh, who also tweets on behalf of the museum. All right. I'm happy to take your questions now, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Um, you had a couple of questions. Uh, Ted, would you like to ask the question yourself directly or do you want me to read it? I'll read it. Okay. Given the December 2020 announcement that Major League Baseball would recognize the Negro Leagues as a major league, do you think it follows that additional Negro League players should be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame? Well, we shall see, Ted, and I know that you are an advocate for a couple of different players, especially Rap Dixon. I think in general, uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame should consider many more Negro Leaguers. I think, uh, uh, so there's two parts of this question I want to talk about. One, the Hall of Fame uh, had uh, uh, boosted its numbers of uh, Negro League uh, honorees back in 2006, where there was a special committee that voted uh, to in, to uh, add more players uh, that was commissioned by the Hall of Fame. Ultimately, 17 new candidates were added. And that was a very momentous day, but there were a number of people uh, who did not uh, get enough votes to be added. I know Rap Dixon is among those who were worthy consideration. There's a movement also for John Donaldson, and there's always been a movement for Buck O'Neill. Uh, and these were players who were under consideration on the long form ballots, but did not make it uh, to final consideration. So the Baseball Hall of Fame has said that they will reopen those considerations. Um, and I think they actually were hoping to do more of that last year in 2020. Uh, but COVID forced them to uh, postpone those considerations in that vote, I think for two reasons. One, the pandemic, um, uh, but also a very important person in that process, the vice chair of the Baseball Hall of Fame, Joe Morgan, uh, who unbeknownst to a lot of people was quite ill and ultimately passed away last year. And I think uh, Delane, uh, and I know he's an advocate in charge of uh, response to the Negro Leagues because he had a deep passion for it. He often talked about writing about the Negro Leagues as a young student and learning about them. So I know, and I've had personal conversations with him knowing that he was an advocate for more Negro League players for the Hall of Fame. But I think his illness and passing also kind of derailed the hopes of having the um, the uh, the con new committee considerations last year. So um, they've pushed some of those to 2021 and we'll see what happens that we wouldn't know who would be considered until probably late 2021 with votes possibly in December of 2021. And um, it's important to kind of explain to folk what the elevation of the Negro Leagues means and how it's been defined. Uh, so Major League Baseball has decided to elevate seven different leagues from the Negro Leagues. Um, I told you that the museum recognizes close to eight, uh, but there are seven of these leagues that they will elevate. The museum generally covers the history 1860 to 1960 with emphasis on 1920 to 1960. The seven leagues that MLB is elevating operated from 1920 to 1948, 
one year after Jackie Robinson integrates baseball. So it's not all the Negro Leagues. It's not the incomplete history of the Negro Leagues. It's a very distinct section of teams and leagues that are being elevated. That's one part, important point. Um, finally, uh, the statistics are evolving. They're being added to. I mentioned earlier in my talk that the team in Philadelphia would play the team in New York for league games and play a lot of teams in between. Those are not league games in between. Those stats don't count. All right. So they've got to sort through the Philadelphia, New York games, for example, and ignore the rest of it, uh, which means that, as we know, anecdotally, a great player like Josh Gibson uh, is said to have hit well over 800 home runs in his career, but that's against all competition. His league statistics are, are going to be significantly lower, maybe closer to 300 in the end, uh, after they keep mining uh, for these for these records, because the records were not kept in the same way. We don't have, we have very few record books that have survived. Most of the other material is in box scores that were covered by weekly newspapers. And the New York Times did not cover the Black Yankees or the Cubans or the, or the Eagles in the same way they cover the Yankees and the Giants. They, uh, it was the Amsterdam News and other weekly newspapers, Black weekly newspapers that covered them on a regular basis. So we don't have a day-to-day -day record of the Negro Leagues. And we may never will have, we may never have a record like that. But we do have some. And uh, there are historians diligently working to put that stuff in sites like Seamheads. The museum is not involved with this at, at any point. We are consumers of this information as much as anybody else. So we're trying to interpret that for everyone. Uh, but just as an example, you're not going to see Josh Gibson overtake Babe Ruth. This is not going to happen. You might see, uh, and as the historian of Major League Baseball, John Thorne says, history is a process, not a product. So this is going to be an evolving situation. Uh, what you might see, though, is Josh Gibson, who had a 400 batting average season, be listed above a Ted Williams. You might see that happen. But as one patron who, in fact, several patrons who have emailed me wanting to know about Henry Aaron, because they don't like Barry Bonds for whatever reason. Barry Bonds is the all-time home run leader. Uh, they want to see, well, now does his Negro League stats, will that put him past Barry Bonds? No, primarily because 1920 to 1948, Aaron doesn't start the Negro Leagues until 1952. His Negro League stats are completely irrelevant to this discussion. And with that, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is what book would you recommend on the history of the Negro League? And somebody said Shades of Glory by Dr. Lawrence Hogan. Do you agree? Do you think there are other ones? What do you think? That's a very good choice. And that was uh, commissioned in part by the Baseball Hall of Fame as part of their effort with the 2006 election. And, and Dr. Hogan is just a great dude. He's over at Union. Well, he's retired from Union County Community College uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and is among the dean of Negro League scholars that are out there. Um, I do often refer people to Leslie Heafy's book, uh, which is a great college level textbook, which is the Negro, the Negro Baseball Leagues 1859 to 1960, I believe, um, and, is a little, and uh, gives a, a good deal of uh, general history that you could have. There are older books people often point to the classic uh, Robert Peterson's Only the Ball Was White, which is a good starting point for someone who just wants to get in to the, uh, the beginnings of the history. And then you can go really deep down the rabbit hole if you want to get to biographies and statistics and things like that. Uh, but honestly, between those three books and a few others, uh, you'd be as much of an expert as me, frankly. <laughs> Brian Lapinto, who's with the Friends of Hinchcliffe Stadium in Patterson says, can you ask Dr. Doswell about the importance of having home plate return to the exact location when the stadium reopens? Um, I don't really have an opinion on that, but it would sure would be great, I think, um, uh, if that could happen, if you have home plate. Um, um, authenticity is important, uh, but I guess it, it depends on if the stadium just could be at its highest and best use. If the idea is to restore the stadium, 
as a museum, then that's one thing. If the purpose is to restore the stadium so that it could be used by the community, that's another thing. And the fact that you're cleaning that site up and that you are uh, remembering that story there is as important as whether it's gonna be a baseball field or not. I just think that the fact that the community and the nation now that it's a historic landmark is rallying around that is, is wonderful for the community. Uh, and uh, I wanna encourage you all to keep uh, pushing and striving with that. Kathleen asked, what is your background? Did you play ball or is this your passion project? How'd you get here? <laughs> okay, this is my life as quickly as I can. So. Um, I'm a high school teacher by training. I, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois, which means that I'm a St. Louis Cardinal fan. Uh, not so much a baseball fan, I'm a St. Louis Cardinal fan. So that's different. <laughs> we're the best fans in baseball and we're proud to say that and we're snooty about it. Uh, having said that, uh, my love of baseball starts with Lou Brock who was uh, the one only baseball player I idolized. Uh, and so I was heartbroken last year when he passed away. Um, but still, um, uh, as a baseball fan growing up and becoming a teacher inspired by social studies teachers that I had and wanted to become an educator. Uh, but I got an opportunity to do an internship uh, at the University of California to learn about public history. Of course, that, so that means uh, I mean, th there are public historians that work in corporate archives and things like that, but that means working at museums, working in archives, working for historic preservation sites and things like that. So I learned about that field as an option, but I got an opportunity after that to, to teach and I taught in the St. Louis area briefly, uh, which was a rough season, uh, but it was fine. But when you're a young person, when a lunch lady thinks you're just a mature student at the high school, then, you know, you're probably too young to be there. But uh, um, we did that, but the graduate school after the internship called me back and said, you know, we can figure out a way to get you your advanced degree if you want it. And so talked to my family, talked to my colleagues, and they said, go for it. And so I trucked out to California again and uh, got a master's degree in history with an emphasis in historic resources management. So that's the museums, archives, preservation, extra stuff. Learned about the baseball museum as it was beginning in 1993, 94. Needed an internship as part of that program. They weren't ready, the baseball museum wasn't ready to have interns. So I ended up going out to do my internship at the Smithsonian um, and uh, for Washington DC for a few months. Worked there at a, at, in DC at the Anacostia Museum, which is part of the Smithsonian, but it's not on the mall. It's in, in uh, Southeast Washington is African American Museum. Uh, worked on music there, which is really part of mostly my background and training. Uh, wrote back to the museum when I was finishing school and said, now I need a job. And they said, well, we need a curator. And um, I interviewed, they hired me on the spot. I've been here since then, that was 1995. And I've had growing roles ever since. I don't consider myself a baseball historian in the way that my good friend Ted Knorr is or some others. Um, my goal is to connect people with information. Uh, and as a result through osmosis and knowing people and reading and learning, I've become someone who's knowledgeable about where things are, but I'm learning every day. But again, my goal is to connect people with this information. So. Um, and also interpret that information for the masses. And that's through exhibits, through photos. I do a little bit of research on my own, but for the most part, what I do is for the museum and for teaching. And so I, I present to school groups, I present to classes. I sometimes, when able, I'm traveling across the country, presenting to this, presenting this history to many different audiences. What do you think made the Negro League so successful in the earlier years? Well. Fan support, I think, was probably the big thing that allowed them to to uh, be successful. And there's some people who can probably speak to this who studied it more diligently than I have. But I think uh, it's hard not to separate the impact of the migration of African Americans and the influx of Black people into the cities, uh, especially where these teams would operate, to get fan support for these teams. It was very important. Uh, without fan support, teams folded very quickly. Um, and because Black people were moving into these places, was again, even though there was segregation and, and, and racism in many respects, you started to see a slowly growing Black middle class, 
with money and disposable income to do leisure activities like go to jazz clubs, raise families, and go to baseball games. And so uh, when the when the stock market crash happened, that's why the, those early leagues folded, um, among other things. Um, but when things got better, things rebounded. And, and the war effort also coincided with economic growth in the country. And that's why you saw a team like the Grays be able to be successful because folks would come out uh, to those games. So fan support is probably among the biggest things uh, that could happen. And of course, having leagues meant stability for the teams. Uh, it didn't always work out for some teams, but having stability of knowing when your paydays were coming and all you had to do was be challenged by the weather, uh, that just made for things to work out better. Uh, Lance says, the Athletic had a series of the outsiders that highlighted many of those who haven't made the Hall of Fame. Curious if you know of it, and would you want a separate part of the Hall for inclusion or want full integration for all Hall of Famers? You should never segregate the Hall of Fame, never. This was debated back in the 70s um, when there was early consideration of Negro League players. Um, first of all, let's go back to 66. Ted Williams in his Hall of Fame speech advocated for the, in, in, for the induction of Negro League players in his, in his own personal Hall of Fame speech. Committees were formed to try to figure out what to do there was certainly a list of known players who should be honored, like Satchel Paige, who would be the first among the Negro Leaguers to be honored. And there was consideration to have a separate wing just for Negro Leaguers, and no one wanted that. Um, and I didn't blame them. We don't need a separate wing. Um, they were ball players. you're honoring American ball players, and you honor them with the others. Uh, Having said that too, the Baseball Hall of Fame over the years has done much, much more to try to improve their uh, um, knowledge on black players and the Negro Leagues, as well as showcase that in the museum. In 1997, they opened an exhibit, um, um, I forget the name of it, I think it's called Pride, Pride and Perseverance or Pride Against Prejudice. That's the name of a book. So I think it was Pride and Perseverance. Uh, but uh, it's a, it was a new wing. It was a wing of the Hall of Fame that's specifically dedicated to African-American baseball, including their holdings on the Negro Leagues. But it's not an induction wing. It's just a more detailed telling of that story. And I had saw what they had before on the Negro Leagues, which was just one wall. This is one giant room now. And they've done a fantastic job. And they're great partners of ours, I should say, too, providing a lot of photography that we use in the exhibit and uh, been very helpful in what we do and vice versa. We try to help them. That's great. And Ted says it's pride and passion. Pride and passion. Thank there you. There we go. I got, my, all right. got all these, these P's mixed up. So. Yeah, there you go. Well, I want to thank you so much, Ray, for joining us tonight. It was really great. Um, I've enjoyed it both times I saw it today. So uh, appreciate it. Stay well, everybody. Uh, in two weeks from tonight, Helen, who's going to wave, Helen is going to be talking about um, the many, many trains at Montclair in Montclair um, and the train stations. If you know anything about Montclair, you know that really it was the trains that sort of shaped it into the community it is today. And if you know anything about Helen, her presentations are always phenomenal. So hope you join us in two weeks for that. Um, you can always find it on our website. Uh, you can find the link on our website. So take care, everybody. Um, stay well. Bye-bye.